Hey everybody, this is Tim Chavez from Faith Matters. The political climate in Arizona has been unseasonably warm recently, frequently making national news. And it seems that political tribalism has even caused division in some Latter-day Saint wards and stakes. It raises the question that many of us have started asking, could political identity begin to eclipse religious identity in some parts of the church? In part one of a two-part series on the church in Arizona, Bill from Faith Matters sat down with Mesa, Arizona Mayor John Giles and Councilwoman Julie Spilsbury about division that erupted around an LGBTQ non-discrimination ordinance. We think this is a really important conversation and we hope that you enjoy listening. Okay, everyone, this is uh, Bill Turnbull and we are here today with Mayor John Giles from Mesa, Arizona and Councilwoman Julie Spilsbury um welcome you two thank you thank you it's good to be with you i'll be scorching hot in arizona right now so <laughs> it's warm it's only 100 only 100 degrees right now oh guys. it's just starting to get warmed up no big deal <laughs> well it, and maybe that reflects the hopefully that reflects the political uh temperature too moderating a little bit but you've had some interesting times in uh arizona and in mesa Bill, can I begin by with with a shameless plug? We just start uh, we just start launched a a uh, an, our competing podcast to yours. It's called "It's Always Cool in Mesa." Now, since you brought the temperature up, it's not necessarily about the temperature, but it's about all the cool things in Mesa, Arizona. Really cool. Okay, well, we wanted to. Uh, you've had an interesting um, last few months in Arizona. We're, we'll probably talk about some broader issues uh, toward the end of this conversation, but we, we want to start. By talking about so, uh, a few months ago, I can't remember when it was. I, I was on the phone with Tom Christofferson, who's a member of our advisory board, and he just happened to be on his way to the mayor's home to film uh, a kind of a. Uh, you could tell us more about that, Mayor Giles, but um, and he made me aware of a non-discrimination ordinance that that uh, was in the in in the midst of this political fight in in Mesa. Um, Julie, I then learned that you were, um, you had a lot to do with getting that going. So can I, can you just frame that for me? Maybe Mayor Giles start and or Julie pitch in wherever you feel. Sure. Uh, thanks, Bill. Well, this, this actually uh, goes back years, frankly. I, I, I was uh, elected in 2014. And at that time, you may recall the whole country, you know, was uh, non-discrimination ordinances were, were turned on CNN, you know, and that's what people were talking about. And North Carolina was being boycotted and Houston was had referendums and it was just uh, the national issue. And it was very much uh, part of the agenda for HRC and other LGBTQ advocacy organizations to be out uh, encouraging these ordinances and these statewide laws. So, and, and locally our uh, human relations advisory board uh, had recommended that Mesa take up this issue. So when I arrived on the scene, this, you know, this was on our plate and, uh, and at the urging of Apple and other major employers, you know, it was clearly something that we were, that we needed to talk about. Uh, so back then we started engaging and, and you, everyone listening to this will know that the LDS church was in the middle of all these conversations as well with the, the Salt Lake uh, ordinance and the statewide law in Utah. So, um, and Mesa, we might as well just say it, Mesa has the reputation for being a, a Mormon, quote unquote, you know, a city, uh, even though I have, actually our population is probably at or below 10% LDS, but we're a city of a half a million people. So that's still, you know, it, well, more than half. So we, we got 50, 60, 70,000 LDS in our city, but it's, it's relatively about, you know, about a, a, a 10% population. So you, for all, all, all you two are you two are Latter Day Saints to be. Oh uh, yes, we are. Correct. We are so, two of three on a seven with the mayor and six council members. There's three of us that are LDS. So would you say there's a sort of an outsized political uh, influence of Latter Day Saint people in Mesa, ten percent of the population, but perhaps more influential politically? Yeah, I think it feels like a lot more than that because a lot of them are the ones who are involved in everything, right? So. Okay. Right. If you, if you look at our, our legislative representation and everything, the, the LDS population is over, but we would punch above our weight politically, uh, I guess would be one way to say it. But, uh, but when it comes and we, and you know, people know LDS people vote, right? So, so it, it is a, an impactful part of the, the uh, political equation in, in Mesa for sure. Um, 
so uh, anyway, we we took we spent a lot of time and energy working on this back uh, in 2015, 16. Ultimately, it, it, we could see I, we saw it was a, a very divisive issue, and we decided to kind of let things mature a little bit, and so we put it on the shelf. Uh, January of this year, when, when Julie and I were, were both being sworn in after we were elected on the same uh, same cycle, uh, I was reelected. Julie was elected for the first time. Uh, we let it be known that this was an issue that we thought was the time was right to bring it back. Uh, and so uh, we, we did so. And on March the 1st is when we had our council meeting uh, and had a, a 5-2 vote uh, adopting a non-discrimination ordinance in the city of Mesa. Uh, we think it, that we did it, frankly, I'll pat, pat ourselves on the back. We think it's a very good ordinance. We, we went through a lot of iterations, a lot of meetings, a lot of discussions, uh, and came up with an ordinance that I think can be a model in other cities. Uh, in spite of that, uh, you know, there was pushback and uh, immediately uh, you know, March the second or third, uh, a group uh, filed for a referendum to, to, to take it to the, to the vote of the people. Uh, and that is when Tom Christofferson and Julie and I and others you know, uh, tried to, got engaged in, in responding to that effort. And um, <clears throat> would you say that that process in, in crafting this ordinance, who are the stakeholders? Who are the, you mentioned the Utah, well, some people call it the Utah Compromise this, that surprised a lot of people. I think that was in 2015, right? And it was, I think it was LGB representat representatives of the LGBT community. Uh, the LES Church was heavily involved in that. Um, and legislators, obviously, what, you know, on your side, how did that how did that look as it was being crafted? All of the same. I mean, but back in, in 2015, 16, uh, I was uh, I'm, I met, you know, in Salt Lake with people, uh, talked a lot with LDS church uh, attorneys, also uh, met many times with uh, the ACLU and HRC and others on the LGBTQ side. Um, and you know, did, did, there was a lot of due diligence that went into it. Our, our city attorney at the time just had binders and binders. You know, she spent uh, months uh, and, and knew every, where every semicolon was in every, you know, city ordinance across the country. So it was a very engaged process. And then we, we, we rebooted that again uh, in, in this year as we, uh, we retooled to, to reintroduce it. And did the LDS Church officially play any role in this? Um, well, at the at the institutional level, either locally or at the um, or from Salt Lake. Yeah. Well, I'm not doing a good job of, of engaging Julie in this conversation. I apologize. So I'll, I'll try to be as concise as I can. Uh, like I say, the first time around, uh, yes. I mean, I, I, I met with church officials. I met with uh, public affairs. Uh, my, my, Curtin McConkie was involved. I mean, it was the, the church was was very hands on. Uh, this time around, I after we we had it drafted, I sent it to the church, and I said, "This is just a you know kind of a courtesy uh, shout out. You know, please take a look at this." And and I did that not just with the LDS church. We did it with the, with everybody. You know, the LGBTQ organizations, uh, other faith groups, uh, the evangelical uh, political folks. You know, everybody got equal access to weigh in on this. Uh, I, the, the LDS Church uh, looked at it and they said, hey, you know, you, you, what, you, what we need is, is in there. And so, and, and we all agreed at the time, thank you, you know, no need for you to, to take, play a public role in this. Uh, you and everyone else, you know, we're just soliciting your critique of this ordinance. Now, once the, the referendum issue came up, I called them back <laughs> and I said, you guys, the, um, you know, the, the folks at the front of the parade of this referendum are, are our church members. Now, to be clear, and, the referendum was pushing back against this ordinance. There was a refer referendum to what? To what was the referendum, basically? Julie, why don't you take that one? Okay, well, so, yeah, a lot of people were not happy that it passed and didn't want it for our city. And so, well, or they wanted, they wanted the voters to decide. So the referendum was to get enough signatures so that it could go on the ballot, which wouldn't be till fall of 2022. Mm -hmm. um, and this was supposed to go into effect June 29th. And so it wouldn't go into effect and it would be held off and cost everyone a lot of money and cause a lot of <laughs> um, 
discord in our community if it kept going. But they did get enough signatures until, <laughs> I don't know if you want to take it over there. Well, so, so this, this was a pretty Herculean effort. You know, we had to, uh, the, the other side was, uh, they'll say that it was a grassroots effort. Uh, and it was to a, a, a large extent. There was a lot of, you know, particularly in the LDS community, a lot of volunteers that went around and circulated uh, petitions. It was also uh, a, a paid effort uh, from the kind of Christian right, uh, religious right organizations. They contributed tens of thousands of dollars to this, and there were paid circulators that were out getting these signatures as well. They had 30 so, days to get nine, a little over 9,000 signatures, but then you need a buffer. So that's a lot of signatures to get in 30 days. Yeah. And they did it. And, and so, and, and so in, in, in response to that, we, we mounted a, an equally uh, strong or actually stronger effort uh, to challenge those signatures. And uh, we were successful when, when, but when, when we scrutinized those, you know, whether or not they complied with the legal process, they acknowledged that they fell short. And so the, uh, they, they dropped their, uh, their efforts. Okay. So the, the ordinance will go into effect. Okay. Yes. So that's the latest. Yes. So it's, the, uh, it's, it's really interesting. It's, you seem to have um, the institutional church on the one hand saying, you've covered all the bases for us. Our, our concerns are probably, they're probably about religious freedom. Um, and uh, there are, genu would you uh, acknowledge that there are genuine concerns when these issues come up around religious freedom? And what, what would those be? What would those, uh, what were yeah. those issues that you had to address with this ordinance? Well, let me, let me, I keep, I'm going to keep going back in time. 2015, I, I recall uh, sitting in my kitchen and listening to a, a press conference, you know, from uh, three apostles and, and uh, other uh, organizational general authorities of the church on this topic. Elder Oaks at the time said, I call on local elected officials to adopt ordinances that protect religious freedom and protect the civil liberties of the LGBTQ uh, population. So, uh, I, I believe that you can do both. They're, they're not mutually exclusive. And so I think we can have an ordinance, and I think we do have an ordinance that, that, that passes muster with, with the LDS Church and others who are concerned, rightfully so, about religious freedom, but at the same time protects, you know, provides the protection that the LGBTQ uh, community is it so, so much deserves and is anxious to get. So specifically, so, what, are those, what are those rights? Give us the bullet points yeah. on, both, on both the LGBT civ civil liberties side and the religious freedom side and what was protected. Great. Uh, here, here's my short answer that Julie will flesh out. Obviously, there, there's three components to a non-discrimination ordinance. There's uh, housing, employment, and public accommodation. Uh, the, the Utah uh, Fairness for All uh, legislation is, is great on housing and employment, kind of, you know, not entirely embracing uh, the uh, uh, public accommodation. Uh, we, uh, so, to, to pass muster with the LGBTQ folks, you, you need to, to check all three boxes. Uh, to pass muster with the religious freedom folks, what they what the, the gold standard is, hey, exclude us. You know, just recognize that, that, that we have a First Amendment right to practice our religion and city ordinances can't, you know, erode our First Amendment right to, to practice our religion. And so that's what our ordinance does. It, it's just a flat out, we exclude churches, we exclude religious organizations uh, and uh, don't pretend that this ordinance has anything to do with them. So basically your outlaws says you can't discriminate in housing. You can't uh, not rent or not sell a property, for example, to uh, a person, to an LGBT person or, and so housing and employment basically the same thing. You can't deny employment or discriminate other ways in, in, in employment, right? Is there any, does it go beyond that? That kind of the, that pretty much cover it? I'm sorry, Julie, go ahead. No, <laughs> you do, you do. I have more of the touchy-feely side of this and he has, <laughs> he has a lot of the knowledge, which I've learned and can talk to, talk to great lengths yeah. too. But um, yeah, that, that is the biggest difference, I think, with our legislation was that the public accommodations was addressed. So the Utah Compromise has the housing and the employment. Um, the Equality Act that's being presented to Congress doesn't have any of the religious protections or protections for schools or anything like that. Um, but what the church has stated is that they support the fairness for all legislation that's being proposed. And that actually does have accommodations, public accommodations. Explain public accommodations for our audience. What do you mean by that? <clears throat> um, 
I, there's probably a better way to explain it, but the main thing that I think it does is that it allows people to use the bathroom of the gender they identify with. Mm. So it does a lot more than that, but that would be the sticking point. So uh, most people are fine with housing and employment issues. They're not okay with the um, transgender woman using the girl's bathroom. And I think that's where a lot of people got hung up on. Is that where the energy came from in, in the opposition to this? Is that, is that where really, was it really that issue? I think so. Okay. What would you say, Mayor? Yeah, I, 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 think, I think most people, including in, in the LDS community, have evolved you know, uh, on, on, on recognizing uh, the legitimacy of, of gay rights. Uh, and homophobia is, is uh, wonderfully you know, less evident than it has been you know, when, when we were younger. Uh, we still got a ways to go when it comes to transphobia. Uh, and so that is, uh, I, I don't remember talking throughout this process with anybody who said, no, I think we ought to be able to, I, I don't want to treat gay people, you know, uh, the, the same as I have to treat other people. Never heard that. What they all will focus on, it was the issue that Julie identified. And, and even like in Houston, where, where this ordinance, where one of these ordinances was set aside, the opposition will just boil it all down to this is the bathroom ordinance. This is about, do you want uh, a transgender uh, woman in your little girl's bathroom. That, that's the only, that's the emotional uh, issue that frankly is not supported by any data, not supported by rational, you know, uh, discussion. What do you that, mean? That's, it, it turns out not to be an issue in practice. It, when, when these ordinances actually take place, it, it, it just yeah. doesn't come up as a problem. There are, there are statistics that show that ordinances like this are in 322 cities across the nation with no increase in incidents, public safety incidents. Um, the state of Arizona, there's seven cities, including Phoenix and Tempe, that have had these ordinances. Phoenix and Tempe have had them for seven years, is that right? Without ever issuing any kind of citation, right? So the fear going around, and I, on top of the bathroom issue, there was just a lot of rumors going around that just weren't true but all it takes is someone posting or going around and putting it on people's doors 10 bullet points of what this ordinance would do and then it gets reposted and maybe nine of the ten aren't true but it doesn't matter at that point right so it was just really i i was in the thick of it on social media and i felt like i was just trying to put fires out everywhere i went and i it was so hard to try to get people to come back to like what the actual truth was. There was a rumor going around that the city of Mesa wouldn't let you say ma'am or sir. <laughs> I, I don't even know where that one came from. I mean, there were just, there were things like that going around lots and lots of rumors about schools, which this doesn't touch schools. Schools are exempt because they have their own governing board. Lots of rumors about sports, lots of, I mean, just a whole gamut of things that it didn't, we never, we're trying to address that they weren't issues. The transgender fear, it, like the fear people have of that a man could be in the bathroom with their little girls was terrifying to some people. But if you talk through the issue and you say, look, they're not safe. A, a transgender woman is not safe in a men's bathroom. And if she, they probably already are using it for one thing, but they walk in and they go to the bathroom you know, they shut the door, go to the bathroom, they come out, hopefully wash their hands like the rest of us should wash our hands and leave. And so the fear to me, I mean, I have five daughters. Um, I'm a mother, right? Like I would, I, hopefully someday we'll have lots of grandkids. I, I would never do something, vote for something that would put my children in danger. I've always been afraid of public bathrooms as a mother, right? You don't go in, you don't let your kids go in by themselves ever. You know, you're always watchful because bad things happen. Bad people do bad things. And having an ordinance all of a sudden wasn't going to open up the floodgates to have people who are sitting at home. Oh, man, I wish I could pretend like I was a woman so I could go in the bathroom and do bad things to people. Like, it's just, to me, it was very unfounded. Right. Yeah. They were, so opponents seemed uh, to be okay with the idea that they're, could still exist discrimination on housing and employment because if that's the cost of possibly avoiding a restroom 
incident, it's worth it. Is that? <laughs> well, I, I think, fr frankly, the federal law has evolved on this, you know, to, to the point now. I mean, there are Supreme Court cases that uh, and, and uh, the Biden administration, you know, made announcements as to how they're interpreting things. So housing and employment, the, the, the Mesa City Ordinance didn't move the ball, you know, an inch on that. that those things, if, if you thought it was OK to discriminate in housing and employment before the Mesa Ordinance, I, I'm sorry, you were wrong. That, that you, you can't do that regardless. Fill in so the really, yeah. So, so, so we, we, we moved the ball forward, though. We did move the needle on, so on public accommodation. Yeah, OK. So, so then someone might say, well, this, is this a solution in search of a problem? Um, mm -hmm. why, why a lot do of you... people said that. <laughs> Julie, tell them why that's not true. <laughs> no, well, that, I mean, a lot of people said that. Like, you're creating something that's not needed. Everyone in Mesa treats everyone nice. No one discriminates. Like, th these are all the things we heard, right? But for the people who have been discriminated against and for their families, this was huge. This was absolutely needed. Um, it meant the world to these to these people, our brothers and sisters, and to their families. And it does, um, we, we want to be known as an accepting, welcoming city. And this is sort a of great way of, to do that. Sort of an act of solidarity by the city of mm -hmm. Mesa in that, in that sense. Is that, okay. Yeah, it, I mean, it, if, if there's no, if for no other reason, if this was just a, a, a feel good, you know, public policy statement, heck yeah. I mean, that's a great reason to do this. I mean, look, look at the LGBTQ kids that are taking their lives uh, and, and suicides, and particularly in the LDS church and in other communities. If we can send a message and it's, and it, it, it's not something that gets, you know, uh, a punitive thing that gets enforced with, with uh, court cases and citations, but it's just a, a social, a, an awareness campaign where we give, we're, uh, I mean, I, I had friends, uh, it, I was in high school in the late 70s and 80s. I had friends that came out later as, as gay. And I, I don't know how they didn't commit suicide. I mean, I, I look at the tragedies, you know, that, that uh, are scattered throughout, you know, our, our community and, and, and other communities. And if we can do something that helps a little bit on that, that is a, that's a heck of a good reason to do this. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so let, let's get to the issue of, I, I think it's it's interesting. Um, if you look at the history of our church on this particular issue, you had Prop 8 in 2008, which I think even I think everyone just realizes was a mistake, right, at, at this point. And the church really um, came a long way in a very few years on that issue, culminating in, I think, the, in the Utah uh, compromise. So, but... But the, so the institutional church may have come a long way, but you, what, I, what I'm hearing, a lot of this opposition was, was almost operating in contradiction of that, of the institutional position of the church uh, when it comes to this grassroots level and circulating um, the uh, petitions and, and, and maybe also the energy. Where, did, where, where was the energy coming from? Uh, to what ex I, I'm getting to this question of, uh, how Latter-day Saints are engaging in the political sphere. And what's, your, what's your experience among your constituents in, in Mesa? I'll, I'll start. <laughs> um, so I was the newbie on this one, right? Like I, I got elected um, in August, actually, but I, I didn't get um, sworn in until January. And then the mayor goes and throws this in like the first week. So... <laughs> Um, there were two newspaper articles that came out about it in January. It was posted on the website. There were st several study sessions before the actual vote. But the mayor had actually come to me months before and just said, hey, you need to know that this is going to come up. And I don't know how you feel about it. And I'm not going to tell you how to vote, but you should probably start thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And um, Due to the pandemic, we had a lot more time on our hands. And so in our family with my return missionary college age daughters and my husband, all of us were kind of on this search for truth and opening up our eyes and our hearts and our minds. And so we'd been listening to Faith Matters podcast and we were listening to the Listen, Learn, Love podcast and we were reading books and we were um, kind of, you know, changing our, our, our view of some things that we grew up hearing or were taught, um, our hearts were being opened big time. And, and you can't tell me that that wasn't God doing that in my life because he knew I was going to be in this position. So I had spent months and months 
researching this, talking to a lot of people on both sides. And when it finally came up to the vote, um, there's seven people that were voting. So we only needed four votes. And so we had our three Democrat <laughs> council members that were for sure going to vote for it. And we had our mayor that was going to vote for it, even though he's an LDS Republican. Um, and he, anyway, so there was our four votes. So my vote wasn't needed on this. And um, I was the conservative LDS mom. So I was going to go into the city and protect our, you know, families from evil. And so when the more, as more of the public and, and my constituents and people in Mesa started hearing about this and finding out about it, they were very, very upset, especially because the first thing that went out was from a far right conservative public policy group that had a lot of things in it that were wrong, but that went out like wildfire. And I ended up getting 1,107 emails um, over this issue. Probably 800 of them were negative. Um, if I had to guess, I would say 85, 90% of them were from LDS people <laughs> that were very mad and very angry that we were even thinking of doing this. Um, and they felt like because they voted me in that I should listen to them and I should vote according to what they wanted. Um, I was told by several people that I needed to repent and um, that I was going to hell and that the Lord was displeased with me and the list goes on and on. Right. So, um, but at the end of the day, like I had been researching this and studying it and praying my heart out about what to do. And so for, I knew what the right thing to do was. I just knew I was also going to make a lot of people very angry and unhappy. So sorry, <laughs> get a little emotional about this because it was really hard. Um, so one of the points I wanted to make was as we started researching how the church felt about this and the different legislation that they supported and the different statements that were made and looking at websites, I mean, it couldn't be clear to me that in the city of Mesa, we were doing exactly what the church was asking us to do, that we were providing legislation that protected those religious freedoms and protected these LGBTQ rights. And so I think I tried to spread that as much as I could among the LDS population, sending articles and statements. And even my own mother, I think as she realized like, oh, the church is okay with this, then it's probably okay. You know, like I, I think people just don't know. And if they're not, I, I here I've been on this, you know, journey of discovery for the last year. So I had taken a long time to come to this place. And so I think a lot of people, look, we, we taught a lot of things wrong in, in the church for a lot of years. And I think some people just haven't heard or learned or, or realized there's some learning to do there and some growth that we could do there because we need our LGBTQ brothers and sisters, not just because it's the right thing to do, not just because it's what Christ wants us to do, but because they have gifts and talents that we need, you know, as members of a church to, to gather Israel. Yeah. Wow. Amen. Um, that was a really long answer. <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was a great answer. And I, I, I'm aware of just how emotional, I mean, that must be, that's overwhelming to receive that many personal, and you read them all because you're, you probably- I read every single one. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot to carry. But you're handsomely compensated as a city council person, so I assume that it's well- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, Mayor, do you have any any comments on that? I just want to move on to one more question before we finish. But well, I, I think I, I just want to underscore what Julie said, which is I, I I think that what we did is in lockstep with what the church has asked us to do. And when you know this, I go back to 2015 when when the Elder Oaks issued this apostolic admonition to people like Julie and me to go do this. Uh, and I remember at the time when I heard it, I I don't think it was the spirit because the, the, the thought that entered my head was, oh crap. I don't think the spirit necessarily uses that vocabulary, but, but I, that's how I hear the spirit. So I don't know. Let me tell you. Well, I, I, I thought, man, I do. I don't need this. I don't want to wade into this. I mean, I'm going to get uh, 
I'll be full of arrows, you know, before I can turn around if we take this up. But I think it, it absolutely it was the right thing to do. And, and for those who, uh, who care enough about to, you know, learning what the church's policy is on this, they'll say, man, this is this is exactly what uh, a, a, an, an active LDS person can and should support and endorse and be at the front of this parade. Yeah, well, it's 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 tough. And especially when you go through a process where you've carefully considered options, brought all the stakeholders to the table, you've, you've there's been a very deliberative uh, process here and then and then it, it it ends up getting you know almost shot down mm-hmm. by uh what the, these 10 little bullet points or whatever like these yeah. these little social media posts that are you know that just lack uh that, that aren't aware of the process that went into it and um yeah uh, yes yeah, Bill, can that, let me add something to a previous election. answer but, but you were you were asking again um you're asking, did the church take a position on this? And again, I, I said, we, all, we didn't want the church to take a position on this. because why, why include the church if you don't have to? But once this referendum came up, I went back to the church and I said, I apologize. I told you I wasn't going to ask you for your support on this, but I'm asking for your support on this because this is going to become a Mesa Mormon thing. Right. And so whether you like it, whether I like it or not, whether you like it or not, you know, you, we're both uh, front and center here. And so the, the church, uh, through their regional authorities, issued a statement and, and they, they reiterated what they'd said a million times before, but they did it in the context of what's going on in Arizona right now. And so they, they, it was a letter to the, the people of Arizona saying, let us remind you what, what the church's position is on this. We support municipal non-discrimination ordinances. Uh, and and it, it's not just happening in Mesa. It's happened it's since since Mesa. It's been Scottsdale and Glendale, and there are others, you know, that are uh, on board, or that, that are considering this. And so it was. So I was like, "Wow, thank you, Church, <laughs> you know, for for uh, sticking your head up." Uh, and it was signed by Kirsten Cinema, and it was signed by like six, seven other religious organizations, plus some of the LGBTQ communities. So just so. It was, it was right. an open letter signed by a lot. So continue. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Julie. It was not an, an LDS church statement. It was the LDS church signing on with a lot of great stakeholders, uh, LGBTQ and religious and political. And uh, and what, what I did, I think Julie and I would both say this. It was what was discouraging after that was the way that uh, members of our LDS community went through contortions, you know, to say, oh, well, the church didn't mean that or it, 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 it's not words. <laughs> It's not what it looks like, you know, at the church, we, we're, we're the ones that are correct, you know, in, in, uh, in uh, staying what the church thinks about this. And, you know, so what do you, what do, you do? You know, if, if people will, will see and read and think what they're going to want to see and think and read. Yeah. So the, the broader, we have only a couple of minutes here, um, but uh, I want to get your comments just on the broader political situation in, in Arizona. We referred to this at the top of this conversation. Um, I, I think we realized that it's a little bit of a different ball game in Arizona when we saw this um, rally uh, at which our illustrious Senator, uh, Senator Lee from Utah went down and, and um, uh, called uh, Donald Trump, Captain Moroni. That, that had to be, that had to have him cringing at the uh, church office building. <laughs> um, that, I, I just, I was, I thought that was, Interesting, because I don't think he could have ever said that at a public gathering here. I may be wrong, but it, there was so much that ha- there was a huge gathering of LDS people. Right. And um, and then there's since been um, an, uh, some I think the state legislature has approved an audit of the results of the presidential election in Arizona. And from what I understand, the, the people in charge of the audit are um specifically Trump people. Uh, so I'm, I'm just curious about what's going on in Arizona, guys. <laughs> and, what, and what role is the church playing here? It, it's, we're, we're in a very tribal era politically. And I, I really believe that the church is being called to rise above that. But I wonder if we will. I think we can. I wonder if we will. Any, any thoughts about the situation in Arizona as we close here. I'll, I'll make a few comments. Two, two, two Mormon Republicans in Arizona. Yeah. Um, I 
I have a whole lot I could say and probably a lot I shouldn't say. So, um, but I will just say, I think as polarized as politics is right now and viewing everyone as your enemy, I mean, President Oaks' talk was specifically about this. And my hope is that we can let that go. Like, how do you teach someone about the gospel of Jesus Christ if you view them as your enemy? And I think that we have to let that go. Whatever your political leanings are, you have to recognize the goodness in people and their good intentions. Underscore what Julie said. It's been it's been heartbreaking, you know, to go to church. And and I, I mean, I've been in the same ward and in, in the same neighborhood for 25, 30 years. And so I, I love my church family, my ward family. I mean, like my own. And and so it, and it's been horrible to see how polarized, you know, that this has made our church family. Uh, there's, you know, our, our, our state president, uh, you know, asked us to wear masks and he comes to a meeting and he looks out at a congregation and half the people are not wearing masks. Uh, and it's, uh, and it's hard, you know, I, it's just, ugh, you know, what do you do? This is my family. And I thought these are people that would take a bullet for me. And it comes to find out that they think I'm crazy. And, uh, you know, if, if I read their, their comments on Facebook, it's not very kind. Uh, and so it, that we are, uh, thankfully, I mean, I, I think we're all praying for a reconciliation and a healing and to get past this and to get back to the, the, the situation that Julie described where there's no question that we love each other and, and, and it's okay to disagree on politics for goodness sakes. Uh, and we just need to love each other. And uh, I, I do think there's a role for the church to play in this. I, I, I appreciate when the church gives us wise counsel and, and at the same time reiterates that uh, as Elder Oaks did in the last conference, you know, that don't think that the church is a political party or that uh, you, you can't, there's no, no room for diversity of opinion uh, on politics in the church. Yeah. I don't know how we come together when we don't, uh, when we're so heavily uh, involved in these um, information channels, uh, silos that we, so we need to model that too. I, I, anyway, I, I really appreciate, uh, we're bumping up against time here. I really appreciate the time here. Maybe we can take up this conversation a little bit more later, but what a delightful, uh, thank you for what you've done for uh, representing the, your constituents there in Mesa, the hard work of governing. Um, it gets really personal. Um, it's difficult to imagine why you would want to get involved in the political in political life, but uh, thanks for thanks for taking those bullets, uh, so, and and thank you for spending a little time with us today. Just remarkable. Thanks for the opportunity, Bob. You thank you so much. Yeah. We'll talk later. All right. Thanks so much for listening, and a big thanks to Mayor Giles and Councilwoman Spilsbury for coming on. And as always, if Faith Matters content is resonating with you and you get a chance, we'd absolutely love for you to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. It definitely helps get the word out about Faith Matters, and we really appreciate the support. Thanks again for listening, and as always, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.